Business Matters is brought to you in part by Lion Burger Construction and Berglund Center, where live entertainment lives in the Roanoke Valley. Hello and welcome to Business Matters, a program on Blue Ridge PBS that strives to explore that subject from a variety of viewpoints and scenarios, featuring interviews with the people helping to grow jobs, the economy, and the Blue Ridge region, because business matters. I'm Gene Morano. Our guest today will discuss the business of arts and culture and how to grow that sector. Shalene Powell is Executive Director for the Roanoke Cultural Endowment. She's also a violinist for the Roanoke Symphony Orchestra. And Douglas Jackson is the Arts and Culture Coordinator for the City of Roanoke. And Shalene and Doug, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Um, I want to talk about the cultural, uh, Roanoke and Cultural Endowment first. The website states that the support for the Ro Roanoke Cultural Endowment reaches beyond local arts and culture. It's an investment in a sustainable future for economic health and vitality for Roanoke. Talk about what that means. And uh, it seems like sustainability is one of the keys, keys yep. here. Yep, you nailed it. So, um, well, the Roanoke Cultural Endowment is a very well-planned, um, long-term investment. Um, comprised of both public and uh, private funds. So the ultimate goal is to provide sustainable funding for our arts and cultural organizations. So upon reaching $20 million, we're going to um, award operational grants to Roanoke arts and cultural organizations within the city of Roanoke. So this is really something that we're building to establish that, that we know it's predictable, there is that source of income, and it's going to support arts and culture. Mm -hmm. So basically, once you hit the 20 million, you, you, you're gonna, the, the money that that investment makes, you're gonna feed off of that for grants. And are we talking about grants of different sizes here? You know, for some small arts, arts organizations, a $5,000 grant may be as valuable as a $50,000 grant. Well, that's absolutely correct. So there are um, an array of different, I don't know if you refer to them as tiers, but different kind of operational budgets for our arts and cultural organizations. So the actual application and allocation hasn't been um, defined and designed at this point. We're at 4.2 million um, in, on our way to 20 million. So, you know, we're, we definitely have our foot in the door. Uh, we have a great conversations happening in the, in the private sector with some um, gifts and some donors um, in order to get to that 20 million. You know, we're looking at a 5% 5 spending policy, which would allocate about a million dollars a year that we're able, that wow. will be at our discretion to, you know, award in, in these operational grants. And really, we've been talking about it as um, a percentage. So really focusing on being that consistent, you can bank on this, you know, however, however ideally, ideally an ultimate goal would be to, to fund and support 25% of each of the uh, arts organizations budgets. Um, now in today's, or if you added up all of the budgets of our, our arts organizations, you'd be looking at in order to provide a 25% um, you know, award, that would be an 80 to $100 million endowment. So this is a very long term. This is for our children. This is for our children's children. Um, but I'm so proud of the city. I'm so proud of the support we've gotten from the private side um, that we're actually building this now. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's happening and there's momentum, especially coming out of, the, out of COVID. Mm -hmm. So I know, that, uh, Doug, this, this is something the city's behind. I remember hearing Dave Trinkle when he was on city council, who was a big proponent of the of the cultural endowment. And talk about it from the, you're the head of the Roanoke Arts Commission. Talk about it from the city's viewpoint about why it's important to kind of grow some of these organizations. Oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's kind of fun being the arts and cultural coordinator for the city, for the government, because we can't do anything on our own. It's really all about our, our partners, uh, the organizations that are working hard, uh, no matter what their genre of, of, of art is. Um, it really contributes to the community. And uh, yeah, I was on the Arts Commission back when we were exploring this idea and working with Dave Trinkle and Dave Wine uh, and um, with Susan Jennings, who's the Arts and Cultural Coordinator then. And we looked all over the country and looked at models. We had a big gathering. Um, at, at where we had folks come in from out of the community to, to talk about how we could structure this. So this um, is being done elsewhere successfully? Th there are different models. I don't, I'm, 
Yeah, Shalene can probably talk best about like what community yeah. we well, were. When the community was coming together and kind of defining what is going to be best and what's going to work best for Roanoke, because Roanoke's unique in and of itself, I, I, there was the United Arts Fund, which is kind of similar to a structure like United Way, where all of the arts organizations would come together in a, a given geographic area and say, let's raise funds this year, and then, you know, it's dispersed out. Um, there's also um, a shared resource kind of model where in a, in a way we have that at Center in the Square where there, uh, there are a handful of member organizations right. housed within one. And then there are some like business, um, business services that are provided. But um, the, what the community's feedback was, and I think what came out of a lot of focus groups from the executive directors um, was, hey, we, we like this public partner, private pub, um, partnership. Mm -hmm. Um, where funds are coming from both sectors and, and um, into an endowment. So, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. Right. You know, Marathon's not run in five minutes. Um, and so for this kind of thing, uh, this is going to happen, and we just have to continue beating that drum. So. Are you looking for a couple of heavy hitters or maybe hoping to get some kind of federal money here so to kind of raise that total? Oh, always, always. <laughs> the door is open, huh? The door is absolutely yeah. open. I'm wondering, like, when you start funding some of these arts organizations, are, you know, when you were talking about you really would need, like, an $80 million endowment, are you hoping at some point that if you monitor their progress, that you're, you're able to wean them off what you're giving them so that they can go on out on their own? Um, I mean, that, that they're, they're, they're sustaining themselves enough. Yeah, I, I think that, well, so for an arts organization, a nonprofit, and Doug, I, I want to hear your feedback on this, too. So, you know, Arts organizations are so focused on what their mission is. And so if, if we're building this community endowment, that's never going to go away. They will always have that opportunity to apply for grants and, and, and receive the operational funds. But what's beautiful about that is that it frees up the um, employees' um, time, space, focus, so that they can focus on. They can focus on maybe um, producing that really creative kind of you know, left of center work that, that might not be as accessible, or they can focus on bringing, bringing programs m uh, into different communities. So it, it allows that flexibility mm -hmm. and use of their time. And so that's what I'm excited to see the endowment um, right. kind of alleviate. It'll, it'll encourage them to take a chance on a particular program. Yes. I, th I think that's really well said. Yeah, yeah there's, a, there's a real community benefit. These are 501c3 nonprofit organizations. Sometimes you put the expectation on them that they need to um, be generating a profit, which would go back into the organization. Um, some of the things, you know, th there is there's entertainment value, but there's also cultural value, educational value, the work they do in schools. So those are things that we want to support as a community. Mm -hmm. um, and they shouldn't necessarily have to raise the money themselves uh, in order to do that because they can get off mission pretty quickly, putting on events that aren't directly mission aligned, um, that are just generating income for the organization. Right. And you know, it seems to me like if you, one of the re if you want to keep people in the Roanoke Valley, if they really like arts and culture, you have to develop an arts and culture base where they know they can go to the symphony or the opera or go see a play or go to a museum or a gallery or something. So you've got to, you've, you've got to nurture that. So it really is an economic development issue from the, from the city standpoint, especially. Oh, very much so. Um, every aspect of it. And you think about uh, the economy and what we have to do to either create jobs or attract them, retain them. Um, to expand businesses. You know, we even talk about job creation. Uh, it is a creative uh, aspect. And I think the nature of the community as a creative community, um, kind of the, the creative process that we think of with the arts, mm -hmm. I think it's very much aligned with identifying what kind of community we want to be, um, building the resources to it, uh, to, to, to create that, and um, kind of piecing together all the partners. It, it really is a creative process, and the arts have a, have a role in it. And I know there was that event at Charter Hall a couple years ago where, the, where basically, was it Arts in Roanoke or something, where they, they basically put a price tag on the value for, and I don't remember that, the value for the arts and culture in Roanoke, but that's, uh, you know, I, you, you think in a lot of places that, especially when you're asking for money, yeah. you've got to put a dollar figure on it. You have to say, well, you know, this is going to lead, this, this, this particular cultural institution is going to lead to this because people are going to a brew pub or a restaurant or coming in for, to stay in a hotel or something to see the RSO or something like that. You've got to put a dollar figure on it, even for the cultural endowment. Mm -hmm. 
Well, uh, so the study I think you're referring to is the Americans for the Arts uh, Economic Impact Study that was conducted in 2019. Um, and you know, there had been previous studies conducted by the Roanoke Valley um, Allegheny Regional Commission. Um, so there have been these, these, these data points along the way. Um, what was really um, holistic about this Americans for the Arts um, economic impact study was that it also took into effect, um, into, into you know, consideration audience spending. So there were over 800 audience surveys that were conducted. So we're hearing like, hey, how much did you spend on dinner tonight? Mm -hmm. You know, hey, did you pay a babysitter? Did you, um, you know, are you staying overnight? Are you from out of town? So that was collected as well. So, you know, it's nice to have that bedrock data point of, hey, the arts generate $64.2 million in economic activity. Um, there's 1,700 um, full-time equivalent jobs, and then there's, you know, the 6.5 million in um, state and local taxes that we see benefit coming back. So, you know, it's nice to have that data, but it's so much more than just the data. The arts contribute in so, much, so many ways to like, what Doug was just saying, it's like individual well-being, social, um, so social, social fabric, connection. Um, and we even have uh, with education, you know? Mm. So mm. they serve us. Um, I don't know if we're gonna be talking about the ARPA project coming up, but um, that's one way we're trying to um, uh, highlight the different intersections where arts and, and education. Is that the Year arts. of the Artist project? Or no. That's another exciting project. So what, 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 are you, what, what are you talking about before you forget? What's the ARPA project coming up? Well, um, so um, the city of Roanoke is really great in, in providing funding through ARPA, ARPA grants that and money that became available. Rescue um, plan money, right? Correct. Yeah. Um, and so um, the Roanoke Cultural Endowment, as a nonprofit, we were eligible to apply for funding. And so um, I, I kind of sat down with Doug and, and he had a great idea for a collective project and, and I had an idea. And so we just kind of talked, hey, how, how could the in, endowment come on board, apply for funding, but then use this to benefit the overall arts and culture sector. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there were a couple unique projects that came out of this. And one of them is this arts and culture collective marketing project. Um, essentially, um, the city, to the funding with Roanoke Cultural Endowment, we um, have hired um, Buzz for Good to produce a series. Right. And I was on here. I wanted yeah, to okay, to produce a series of six episodes. Right here at Blue Ridge PBS. Yes, Blue Ridge PBS. Mm -hmm. So um, what we're going to do is kind of shine a spotlight on each of these six episodes in, the, in this series on how the arts impact our community and all of the ways they're adding to that post-pandemic vibrancy. So you see it, um, we kicked it off with the Roanoke Arts Pop event. Um, you see it because uh, there are 35 arts organizations there. I was there. I saw Doug there. Um, you know, we're also going to highlight education, do something with um, the arts and what they bring to the Roanoke City Public Schools. Um, and then there's arts and healthcare and, and community wellness and all of the different programs that are happening um, towards creating a healthy community. Arts and healthcare, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah well, we, there's, the, there's actually evidence based that, uh, that if you can engage in a creative process, um, you know, whether it's the contemplative aspects of it, mindfulness, um, whether it's a mm -hmm. therapeutic um, process, that it can really help in the healing process. So the Carillion Clinic has long had a, 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 the healing arts program, the Dr. Robert L.A. Keeley Healing Arts Program. Sure and have artists and residents uh, that are working both in a clinical setting and working um, out in r local hospitals and such. Yeah, they, uh, they have a fabulous like, employee art show every year. Oh yeah. They had yeah. students painting f uh, ceiling tiles that are going into rooms for people that are recovering, that type of thing. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, you know, I wanted to mention something about uh, public art. Talk about public art in the city, Doug. That's something you're involved with. It, Roanoke has quite a big base of public art and it seems like it's added to every year. Is that another way to get more people uh, interested in arts and culture? It, it, it is. Um, you know, from every, every aspect of when you, you, know, you take a piece of art and you put it in the public setting, um, you're asking people to engage with it, whether it's to you know, give them a break in their day, um, to look at the space differently. Um, there's the engagement process of it as well. 
if a neighborhood works to put a mural up uh, in, their in their neighborhood, um, that's them putting their fingerprint on the world around them. Uh, you know, I, of course, I work for local government, and I really believe in the, um, the, the very close proximity between individuals and the government. I, I think it, it's us. Um, and so this is us in the public art uh, aspect is saying, we're saying, you know, who are we? Um, how, 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 do we, how do we, how do we care for the area around us? What's our, what's our comment on our place in the world? Uh, so whether it's a sculpture on the, on, in a park uh, somewhere in the city, or uh, now we're even putting uh, money, we have a special fund that where we're partnering with business associations or uh, nonprofit uh, neighborhood associations and property owners to put prop, uh, public art on private property that's public facing. Mm -hmm. um, wherever it is, or if it's two-dimensional art that's hanging in the, in the, the hallway um, of one of a municipal building. Uh, we think it is, it's another way that we are connecting uh, as a local government with residents um, and we're kind of together exploring our, our place in the world. Mm. I wanted to go back real quickly before we get to the, uh, the Buzz for Good series, the ARPA series, the, the, these programs. It almost seems like they're how-to programs or something, but who is, who's the target audience for that? Is, is part of it trying to get more people on board with what the cultural endowment's trying to do? Yeah, well, sure. As a facilitator and the ARPA grant recipient, you know, we're, we're sponsoring that and kind of pushing and, and nurturing the, the six-part series narrative. So there's a narrative over these, these six pieces that will be coming out um, over the course of a year. Um, yeah, the, the great thing about these Buzz for Good episodes is that they're, they're, they're produced and they're aired on Blue Ridge PBS. There is, so there's that partnership, but then they're also accessible through the YouTube channels. So they can spread and be shared through any partner or any organization that's being highlighted within this, in this episode. Mm -hmm. And so just right, all you have to do is look no further than the Roanoke Arts Pop episode, which featured uh, 35 organizations participated in that this year. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's just such a joyful, vibrant, anchor event. It was a great way to kick off this series. So that can be spread and shared, that episode, through all of those participating um, organizations, um, social avenues. Mm -hmm. I'll have to watch that episode. I think I wound up in there in a small snippet. I think you're, you're right. You are. You're I right. think so. Michael Hemphill <laughs> kind of wrote me in. Uh -huh. But then I introduced him to uh, Tyler Lyon, Tyler who runs the uh, Grandin Film mm -hmm. Lab. And he did a longer segment with Tyler, and, and that, I said, Michael, you, should, you really need to get this guy. You know, and what Tyler is doing with the film lab with these students, and they, they ran shorts from some of their uh, productions. And I was like, I was amazed at the production values, the sound quality, mm -hmm. the writing and all that. So mm -hmm. there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of hidden treasures in this valley, huh? Oh, the, the really are. And I love, um, I, well, I, I live near Grandin Village, and I love it when the students are out filming. They're, a lot of times they're on the street, I'm like, wow, this feels like we're in you know, New York City or some inter right. entertainment area. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I lived in New York, I'd play hooky once in a while, I'd go into the city and just walk around, and you'd, you'd come across some shoot, you know, the, the old Equalizer program. They were shooting one day in Central Park and all that. Of course, it takes forever to, yeah. to <laughs> get a scene or something. The, on the, um, the, 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 the Buzz episodes, uh, you know, the city's in charge with creating an arts and cultural plan where we say, how are arts and culture going to help us create a strong, vibrant economy? How are they going to create livable, livable neighborhoods? How are they going to help us um, have a place where uh, retirees want to come to because we have lifelong learning opportunities uh, and we're engaging with young people? And these Buzz for Good episodes are a way of us experimenting a little bit. Um, it's not, we can't get everybody in the room together to start um, doing that planning process yet. And I don't think if we did the plan right now, we would know exactly what we, um, w what the arts can fully do for us. Mm -hmm. So over the whole, this whole next year, we're engaging in a variety of ways in partnership um, and exploring and asking artists and asking arts organizations to partner with us and kind of explore and think about it. So when we get ready to write that plan in, in the next year or so, um, we'll really have some, some surprises, I think. Mm -hmm. So you want feedback from artists and Feedback, exploration, that creative process that the arts bring to us. Um, how are we applying that in the community? Yeah. Uh, and I, I do think, you know, you talk about, you know, we're talking about business matters, you know, economic development often 
um, has, has a history of, you know, we watch what other communities do and we follow trends and they're in kind of site, site, site location, we're attracting businesses. Mm -hmm. But it's so much more than that. It's what are we creating from our local assets here? Um, what is the, what's, how, did the, how does the culture feed into that? How, how are we building it? So it's community development, economic development, arts development, they're all mm -hmm. there, I think, in my, at least in my eyes, tightly woven. Mm -hmm. It seems like for a lot of arts organizations, especially smaller ones, um, they, they usually don't have budgets for marketing and maybe their business plan, they need help with business plans. So that, are those some of the things you want to hone in on maybe with, with, with grants? Oh, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's, uh, th those are all great areas. You know, small businesses, a lot of the arts, or arts organizations are small businesses, Art individual artists are small businesses. We've got terrific assets in the community with the Small Business Development Center. Um, we've got uh, kind of mentor-mentee relationships with the organizations that, are, that have, um, arts organizations that have been around for a long time, working with younger arts organizations and more emerging groups. Uh, I think it's really important. Um, these are businesses. Talk about, Doug, the, uh, the Year of the Artist program. That's another program that I guess you're using some ARPA funds. And uh, local artists can apply f for, s for small grants. Talk about that. Yeah, <coughs> and again, this is part of that experimentation that we're talking about. And we've got, we work with the National Endowment for the Arts, and we have a, a, a variety of programs. We're going to kick it off with, well, first off, the Year of the Artist will be from July 22 to ju June of 23, uh, but we're already busy working. Uh, we've got 300 artists who have signed up to be kind of be part of it. Uh, we are going to have, in July, we'll install self-portraits of 50 artists uh, in the municipal building. And these self-portraits are not just of the artists, but the, of the artist in community. So we're asking artists to reflect on their role in making the community a, a better place. Uh, and we've got a, a couple of grant opportunities. Um, we had one that is for artists and residents. We're going to hire 10 artists, at least 10 artists and residents that will work with city government in a variety of ways. Um, they will each be a attached to a challenge or a goal of the, of the community. Uh, we'll have one who's aligned with our exploration of neighborhood centers, how we create more uh, vibrant uh, economic hubs in neighborhoods. So we'll have an artist that's attached to that who is, who is exploring uh, how to engage the neighborhood in that conversation, how to uh, maybe mock up so some of the ideas. Uh, they'll be exploring other creative I ideas from across the country. So that artist in residence program, we're going to be asking artists to sit in on what can often be um, seen as kind of a, sometimes we think of these things as dry. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think they are at all. But um, some, of our, some of our biggest challenges and goals um, and bring their creative process to the conversation. So there's that. And then we also have Art Matters grants. And we have about $100,000 that we're giving individual artists who will apply to us uh, to um, create work that, is, that advances wellness, justice, uh, and inclusion in the community. Mm. That's yeah. interesting. So this is all going to happen sometime this year? Yeah, yeah. We, we're, already, we're already rolling with the applications. Uh, the idea that we'll be, we'll be running uh, come, come July. Uh, so, so we expect to see a whole lot of activity uh, out on the streets, um, in organizations, and across the city uh, all of next year. And Shalene, that's got to be music to your ears because the more people you can get enveloped in the arts where they can see the, the benefit of having the arts around, it's got to be good for the endowment. Oh, it's, uh, you know, anything, anything highlighting the arts and seeing creativity kind of rise and, and be plugged in places where decisions are being made is elevating everything. So, yeah, and, uh, you know, this, the, the year of the artists that the city has rolled out is a phenomenal program. And it's so exciting to see the number of, of, of individual artists that have come together and, and the networks that are, are being kind of connected. I mean, I'm very proud. I'm very excited to live here. Um, so that's one component, you know, of this overall ecosystem that we have here in Roanoke. You know, you have your, your Roanoke arts and culture organizations. You have your individual artists. You have for-profit galleries. Um, and there are, you, you have, I mean, there's so many other components as well. I can't list them all. Mm -hmm. But um, it sounds like everybody's moving in the same direction and coming out in a really positive, healthy way post-pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I also would be remiss if we didn't talk about how many 
programs and concerts and, and festivals are, are going on this spring. So I just want to encourage, mm -hmm. um, and as we roll through the whole year, I just want to encourage our community to get out and support and experience, be a part of, of, of the art and culture here in Roanoke. We only have about a minute or so left, but one of the things you mentioned on the Cultural Endowment website, which I guess people can go to if they want to make a donation, correct? Absolutely, yep. Mm -hmm. um, becoming an arts advocate, how can the average person become an arts advocate? Is it joining a board or is it just patronizing or memberships or what? Yeah, okay, well, I'll list a few things and maybe Doug can add a few. One, I say just even by thinking about participating, like I just said, going out and supporting and seeing a show or, or you know, just ex having that experience. Two, if you're interested in getting involved, um, you know, start seeing if you can volunteer. They're always looking for people to, you know, help with programs or, 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 or volunteer at a museum. Um, so there are a multitude of ways. Real quickly? Y yeah, I'd say integrate your creativity in everything you do. So, so many times I'm surprised by people, Chalene plays the, vi the violin, for instance. Uh, th that can be applied in all aspects of our life and we can, uh, we can align these uh, to make our community a better place. All right, we're gonna have to leave there. Chalene Powell and Doug Jackson talking about arts and culture and the economic benefits of both. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Gene, Gene Morano, this is Business Matters. Thanks for joining us.